Hi, this is Joy J. Moore with a special announcement. Our Working Preacher Fall campaign is in full swing, and we're so grateful to each and every one of you who have given so generously already. Working Preacher relies on donors like you to provide quality content week after week. When you make a gift before October 31st, we will send you a free ebook titled Digital Jazz. Digital Jazz is a workbook to help preachers apply media and technology appropriately to the proclamation of the gospel. Go to workingpreacher.org today to unlock your gift and support this important resource for preachers around the globe. Welcome to I Love to Tell the Story, a podcast of the Narrative Lectionary. I'm Katherine Schifferdecker. And I'm Joy J. Moore. All right. Uh, uh, Rolf was uh, not able to join us this time, so we're going to persevere and uh, talk about uh, the, the text for today. So this is the podcast for October 16th, 2022. Uh, we're moving to the book of Joshua. So uh, first of all, we know that we skipped a lot of material in between because last time we were at Mount Sinai, the foot of Mount Sinai, and Moses had just received the Ten Commandments. So we're skipping over uh, the rest of Exodus with the story of the golden calf and the building of the tabernacle. We're skipping over Leviticus, which I know a lot of people won't think is a big loss, though I really like Leviticus. Uh, wow. We're skipping... <laughs> We're skipping over uh, Numbers and Deuteronomy uh, just because we have a limited uh, you know, number of weeks. And so we're moving on to the book of Joshua. But we're still, so we're, uh, we're at the very end of the book of Joshua or close, yeah, pretty much the very end. Um, and we're talking still about covenant. So we've been talking about covenant uh, since the beginning of this year. We started with the covenant uh, with Noah, then the covenant with Abraham, uh, and then, of course, last week we talked about the covenant at Sinai. So now we have not a new covenant, uh, actually, but a renewal of the covenant here at the end of Joshua. Um, they've, they've come into the land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Moses, of course, has died. Uh, Joshua is, the, is Moses' uh, successor. Uh, and God has promised to be with Joshua. Um, we want to acknowledge first, I think, uh, that that Joshua is n not many people's favorite book <laughs> because there's a lot of difficult things here. Now, there's some some really good stuff like this covenant renewal ceremony uh, that ends with, uh, you know, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, um, harsh things uh, at the beginning of Joshua. Uh, particularly the the uh, conquest of the land uh, and the and the war, the fighting, the battle with uh, the people who are in the land. Uh, so maybe we could say a bit about that. I'll just start with a little anecdote, and then I'm going to pass it over to you, Joy. But uh, I I was teaching these texts, uh, the the Pentateuch. Oh, it's probably been about four or five years ago now, before the pandemic, and. I was kind of saying what I just said, you know, Joshua is a difficult book. There's a lot, you know, we have uh, genocide or, or at least what looks like genocide. We have, um, you know, the, the conquering of peoples in the land uh, and the taking of land. Uh, and, and so most of the class agreed with me, <laughs> you know, that they really didn't like Joshua. It's a difficult book. Of course, I was talking about things like it's probably not historically uh, you know, quite accurate, and that even in Joshua, uh, it's clear that that the people of the land remain, right? That the Israelites actually re, uh, that that they're not the only people in the land; that the, that the other peoples uh, remain. Anyway, so I'm I'm saying things like that, and one of my students raises her hand, and she, she's uh, from the Pentecostal tradition, African American young woman who said. I don't know what y'all have a problem with, with uh, Joshua, because it means a lot to my community, to my church, to me and to my community. She said, for us, Joshua talks about God's faithfulness and, and that even when, you know, the forces, uh, the opposing forces seem about to overwhelm us, um, God is going to bring us through and God's going to give us the victory. Um, you know, speaking of it metaphorically, the, the, the victory being, you know, uh, 
the fulfillment of God's promises for life and and uh, and joy. So, um, yeah. So that gave me a new lens to look at Joshua. That you know, that uh, just reminds me that that texts that may not speak to me personally can speak to other people in ways that are very powerful. I appreciate you you doing that, uh, partly because I also I, I, I share that perspective. I have always been. Um, invited into uh, this promise keeping God covenant, covenant making, covenant keeping God. Uh, and uh, when I see um, what I would describe as evil in the world, we're living in a, a, a time where a lot of folks have, have experienced trauma of a variety of ways. And um, while I in no way want to celebrate, you know, just picking up a 50 pound Bible and using that to wallop somebody across the head to say my my way or the highway. Um, and, and unfortunately, these these stories, these episodes have been used uh, as a weapon uh, to do that. But I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. I don't want to lose the promise that in the midst of evil. God does not turn a blind eye and that God is going to do something where the righteous prevail. And it's, it's, it's encouraging to me because as an African-American who reads all, most of the story of, of Israel post, uh, um, uh, post Egypt, but pre exile as a story of liberation, um, there's also a reminder, if I use a contemporary example, when Nelson Mandela uh, became president of, of South Africa, he formed the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because he knew the propensity of humanity to power over others. And, and so he didn't want Black South Africa to overpower white South Africa in the same systemic way. And so in 1998, he reconvened the Truth and Reconciliation Commission because that's exactly what happened. Now empowered, um, Black South Africa was abusing that power. And so I in no way want us to read this text as permission to abuse because Actually, God says uh, that this would be moving to judges, but God actually says, you know, I'm not going to stand for that for my people either. Actually, this moves to exile. But um, but it is a promise to know that God sees evil and God will address evil. And so in in the fall, this might be the perfect time post pandemic, post um, quarantine for a congregation to be able to take an opportunity to mark the place where they will again live into the covenant of God. Not that God has ever stopped keeping God's covenant and not that we've stopped being God's covenant people, but we have been a little less than faithful and God has been faithful. And this is a reminder, you know, this, this, this episode says you can you can choose you can choose to go this way or that way you can do right. what is right. all right. around you mm -hmm. but as for me in my house it's what a familiar text what a i mean everybody has this plastered somewhere right, yeah, right. needlepoint <laughs> or plaque or whatever yeah, yeah, yeah. Plaque, uh, uh, over the door of their their house or you know but it and that that is exactly what has been skipped over in these texts where they've acted just like everybody else. And so reading this text is a reminder to say, the people of God are not to look like everybody else. Let God handle how God is gonna deal with evil by us keeping the finite covenant, trusting God's provision in how we interact with one another. And if we read it that way, then we, we resist the temptation to power over and we become the recipients of the promise of God to be in right relationship with our neighbors because we're in right relationship with God. Amen, amen, yeah.
Yeah, I, I, I had this a similar conversation just earlier this morning. I was talking to one of our new colleagues here at Luther. And I said, you know, some students, um, particularly when they're studying the Old Testament, they want God to be nice. <laughs> like they just, they're not comfortable with e even stories like the Exodus, you know, which is the ultimate story of liberation, right? Or um, they, they don't like the plagues. No, I'm 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 generalizing here. There's sure, there's a sure. few students like this, but you know we want we want God to be nice, and but nice doesn't overcome evil, right? Like there are Obviously times. Not. What's that? Obviously not. Yeah, yeah. So there are times when, and and I think this text uh, is one of those where you can say God. Uh, God is a God of, uh, of, of full, a faithful God, fulfilling God's promises. Uh, God is a God who, um, who, who fights against evil, what is evil uh, in us and in the world around us. Now, I, I'm not, so an, a big caveat here, right? I don't want to equate non-Christians or anybody else with uh, evil, I, I want to spiritualize this, right? Which I think is what the church has done at its best moments. Now, when the church has used this text or used uh, similar texts in Joshua to say, you know, we're the promised people and so we're going to defeat everybody else. Or, you know, when it's used for things like manifest destiny, that terrible doctrine that, you know, uh, exterminated so many Native Americans. That's a bad use of this text. <laughs> Let's just be really clear about that. Mm -hmm. But if we can use it in a, a you know, it, as as centuries of Christians have done in a metaphorical way, to say this is uh, this is God fighting against the forces arrayed against God, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and and calling us to be faithful, to be uh, to be working for for life, to be working for. God's will in the world, uh, then it can be a really powerful text, especially for communities that have known oppression and uh, not known much uh, much sense of victory. But I, I, I just want to reemphasize what you already said, Joy, uh, and then I'll shut up for a while. But uh, it's really important. I think what you said is really, really important that the people of God themselves can be on the other side of that judgment, right? That yeah that that judgment can be turned around towards us as well. Uh, because you always have to keep Joshua and, you know, like the conquest of Jericho in tension with the conquest of Jerusalem, right? When the, when the people of God are not faithful to the covenant, when they, when they do not live as God's people, then that judgment uh, against evil uh, can be turned towards, against God's people as well. Because of the faithfulness of God. The right. character of God is consistent and God doesn't show favors because, oh, you know, these are my kids, you know, so <laughs> we'll, we'll give them a little. Yeah, no, God is, God, God is calling for, Israel is chosen for the sake of all the world. Right. And, and so, so God is calling for a people to bear witness to the peace and promise of God until that is completely fulfilled. So uh, trusting God until they reach the promised land. Um, in, in this text, which I'm going to go, I'm going to throw in the Matthew text that is related to that one, which, you know, uh, Satan offers Jesus the kingdoms, but Jesus says, worship God and serve only God. And, and that's what this text is about. When we are using these texts to overpower others, to marginalize, to um, enslave, to, um, uh, to wipe out. We are worshiping power. We have made an idol of something less than the full promises of the kingdom of God. And so when, whenever we choose to worship anything less than God, then we are going to be on the end of, we're going to be the enemy of God. We're going to be yeah. the enemy of, enemy of God. Yeah. And, yeah. and that, that, that for me, um, as a woman in a sexist society, as a person of color 
in a society that is racially uh, divided and, and, and likes to use racial categories to pit one group against the other. I'm grateful to know that God is going to call an account to that kind of misuse of power. Um, but at the, at the same time, I believe that this is an opportunity for preachers to convey, uh, pastors to convey to their congregation, you need to choose who you're going to serve. That's yeah. what this is about. Let's spend the time recognizing as in those first 15 verses, all that God has done to keep God's promise. Because there's this rehearsal, right. this rehearsal yeah. of you know, gathering the tribes of Israel, yeah. Yeah. of naming the, the, the sons of Abraham, of, you know, there's, there's just this rehearsal. This is constantly a reminder of who God is and what God is doing. Kind of like so the... That, the, the narrative lectionary, right? Like this is the uh, narrative. That's exactly right. It's, nice it's the, the narrative, right? Starting with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and, and Moses and Aaron and all the women who are not named here. But, you know, it's the uh, Joshua is telling the narrative again, right? The narrative yeah. of salvation. And then, as you said, calling the people to make that their story uh, or to remind them of their story and then to to be part of that story to recommit themselves to the that story of god and that's the opportunity for preaching this week i think amen